got to check out all these electronics. Okay, it works. <laughs> well, you just read the responsive reading about arising and shining. Uh, that's the people of God that is being uh, spoken of in Isaiah 60. And if you look at our church uh, vision, it talks about that, a vibrant witnessing church, using the spiritual gifts to equip disciples for Christ, raising sister churches. I think there's a rising and shining. And I hope that that is the aim and the purpose of each one of us uh, all the time. But to do that, sometimes we think that we're not capable. I think the time is coming soon when the church will be choosing offices for next year. In fact, I believe that sometime in September, October, we'll be doing that. And some people will be asked, can you help out in Sabbath school? Can you help out in the uh, youth? Uh, uh, and so on and so on. And there'll be people saying, I can't do it. I don't have the talent. Uh, ask somebody else. Uh, ask Dr. O. <laughs> and then you have the 2080 rule in uh, all organizations, it seems like. 20% of people do 80% of the work. In any organization. And uh, the 20% are overloaded. And you wonder why some things are not done, you know. Uh, these people holding office, they must do better. But then uh, some of us, when we are asked, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. But you know, God has given each one of us talents and we must use it. So today, I'm not going to concentrate on what we cannot do. I'm going to concentrate on what we can do. And as you look around later, you will see more people who have done things. Hopefully, at the end of this uh, sermon, each one of you will say, I can do. If so-and-so can do it, I can do it too. Because each one of us can be the unlikely hero. We can be unsung heroes. Let me show you uh, what hero means. In the dictionary, a hero is uh, defined, one of the dictionaries I looked up, as a person with exceptional bravery. Or it can be a person with extraordinary accomplishment. But you know, if you take it spiritually in the church, a hero is a person who overcomes handicaps through God's power. And it is a person who by faith does the extraordinary. That's for church members. It's not the secular dictionary uh, explanation of the word. And I'm going to go by this uh, spiritualized definition of a hero. How many people here have imagined yourself doing great things for the Lord? How many of you would like to be that vibrant witness using your spiritual gift? from the Lord. And how many of you have said, I don't have any spiritual gift. I don't know that I have one. Perhaps today, at the end of this sermon, you will be able to find that you have a spiritual gift. Many of us cannot speak up front because of a perceived handicap or poor speaking ability. But you know, when you ask such a person to come up front and speak, they say they cannot they will give you a lecture on uh, why they cannot come up front. They are very eloquent and very convincing that they cannot come up front. Uh, so I believe that even those who are so convincing and eloquent that they cannot come up front, if they use that ability, the eloquence in declaring their helplessness and make it positive, they will be surprised that they can come up front. A hero makes lemonade 
when given a lemon. Yes, some of us, maybe we are stutterers, you know. We, 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 we cannot speak much. Uh, we stutter. Uh, there was a, a story, I think, uh, Thomas Chin, you might have uh, give, given us that story of a man who was challenged to go and sell some things for the church. I can't remember what they were asked to sell. Uh, their church members were asked to sell things. I think Bibles or something like that. And uh, one person came back a week later and said, Oh, I sold five Bibles. Another one said, I sold ten Bibles. And this stutterer sold like 20 or more Bibles. And people were so surprised. They said, How did you do it? Well, he said, Every time we went to the door, people would go, were so pitying him. And also wanted to get rid of this stutterer who they couldn't understand. They just bought the book. <laughs> and they saw more than any of the others. So he made lemonade out of the lemon that he was given. Uh, I'd like to tell you about someone I really know. His name is Wong Ting Sun. He's in his 50s now. When he was a little baby, he suffered jaundice after he was born. And the jaundice was so severe that it affected his brain. He had permanent brain damage, PhD, permanent head damage. Okay, uh, and uh, this uh, PhD that he had gave him severe deafness and severe nearsightedness, and he is colorblind. And also, he doesn't walk normally. He walks like that. His father was so scared of, of him falling and uh, told him, uh, you should never drive. You'll be a danger to the public. Uh, and here he is on the right side of this picture. Ching Chi is on the left. They're in Nepal. You see, Wong Ting Sen uh, was uh, sent to England to do computer science. And while there, he didn't just do computer science. He took up mountaineering. A person who is uh, short-sighted, doesn't walk too well, so deaf, he has two hearing aids. Uh, and he took up mountaineering. He took up the technical aspects of mountaineering, where you use crampons, you, know, uh, you wear shoes that have these uh, uh, teeth you know, underneath the soles of the shoes so you can walk on ice. He yeah, learned rope climbing, rappelling. Uh, he, he, he really became a mountain climber. And with a group of friends, uh, he went to Alaska to climb Mount McKinley. Mount McKinley is over 20,000 feet, and Alaska is very cold. You have to hike in. Uh, like it takes uh, several days to hike to the foot of the mountain before you can climb it. He was the first Singaporean to climb Mount McKinley. And since that time, he has climbed many other mountains. You name the continent, he's been there. Uh, he's been to Nepal like nine times. And he's gone up to 20 some thousand feet. And because he knows his limitations, uh, during the Singapore expedition to Mount Everest, he was the computer guy, not the climber that reached the top. Uh, and uh, he was transmitting f pictures, videos to, uh, the, to Singapore for them to show on their TV. So he, he's very good at uh, computer engineering. And because of his uh, co uh, many trips to Nepal, uh, one, one of the people that he met told him, you know, we have a great need in Nepal. We need a school. And this was the mountain guide, Budu, that he had gone with so many years. So Budu asked him, can you help us build a school? 
and uh, Ting Sen uh, asked me and a couple other friends, Cheng Chi, and we said, we will. So this is the school we helped build for them. The second trip we went to Nepal, we went to see the school. Now, Ting Sen is not 100% well in his uh, climbing ability because he suffers from osteoarthritis like me. So some slopes are too difficult and the Nepali people, the Sherpas, they will carry him. Carry him up or carry him down. Most of the time it's carrying him down. But he can go for a week long or two week long treks in spite of the osteoarthritis. I think I can walk faster than him, but he, that doesn't stop him. He still goes. And here he is sitting with uh, decorations of rhododendrons on him. So if you cannot climb mountains like Tingson, you're not deaf like him. Uh, if you speak poorly, he speaks worse. I can hardly understand him. He talks like that. You have to listen very closely, but otherwise you don't hear him. <laughs> but surely there must be one thing that you can do for the Lord. What would that one thing be? How qualified are you to do that one thing? You know, Moses was a person that was well trained, but after 40 years running away from Pharaoh, running away from Egypt, tending sheep, he had forgotten. It's just like our memory verses that some of us are learning now. We have to memorize it and re, uh, uh, review it. I don't think uh, Moses reviewed his ability to lead armies, uh, to be a leader in Egypt. So for, for, after 40 years, he felt pretty helpless. And when the Lord asked him to go, get his people out of Egypt, go against Pharaoh, he was very, very reluctant. He's like some of us saying, I can't do that, ask somebody else. In fact, he said, I can't talk. I can't talk. And, and uh, God said, okay, I'll send your brother Aaron to help you. He will be your spokesperson. And then he said, what if people ask me, who is this God? What's his name? And God said, I am that I am. <laughs> very, very cryptic type of uh, name. And then he says, well, what if they ask for a sign? You know? And what if Pharaoh fights against us? We don't have any weapons. You know? He didn't say that, but I'm sure that was in the back of his mind. And so God said, what is it in your hand? And he said, a rod. Now, what's so great about a rod? And God said, cast it down. It turned into a snake. And God said, pick it up by its tail. And don't do that with any uh, snakes, okay? Don't pick them up by their tail. The head will come back and strike you and poison you and kill you. You usually catch the snake by the neck, just behind the head. But God said, pick it up by the tail. He did. He became a rod again. And that humble rod was such a powerful weapon. It was a symbol of God's power. It opened up the Red Sea. Uh, and, and that rod was uh, a very simple instrument, but with the power of God, it became a wonderful a uh, weapon, a wonderful display of God's power. Now, what is it in your hand? What is it that you want to do for the Lord? Do you have a rod of some kind? A symbolic rod? God can make use of that. How about the boy Samuel? Was he too young to work for the Lord? He was probably about three, four years old when he was uh, given by his mother Hannah to Eli, and Eli put him to work in a temple. Uh, Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. In fact, he became the youngest prophet because 
God spoke to him at night and told him, I have a message for you. Go to Eli. Tell him this message. And that's the youngest prophet I've ever read about in the Bible. So, young people, you can be used by God. Age is not a problem. Uh, whether you're too young, too old, it doesn't matter. The 12 apostles of Jesus had probably many, many defects so that they were not the best people with the best talents to work for the Lord. And there's a statement here in the Acts of the Apostles that says, the 12 apostles of Jesus, in these first disciples was presented marked diversity. They were to be the world's teachers and they represented widely varied types of character. In order successfully to carry forward the work to which they had been called, these men, differing in natural characteristics and in habits of life, needed to come into unity of feeling, thought, and action. Sometimes we don't all have, each of us, all the ability. One person has a defect, but another person has uh, uh, the opposite of that defect, the ability to overcome that defect. And so when we work together, our defects are minimized by the strengths of the others. If we are united in working, if we independently do our work, then our defects will show up very clearly. So just like the 12 disciples, some of them were good in one thing, others good in another, but when they worked unitedly, they were able to carry the gospel to the then known world, to every creature. It is said in, first, uh, uh, in the Colossians chapter 1, they were able to preach to every creature within one generation when they unitedly worked together. Uh, the Lord Jesus connected even Judas and Peter with himself, not because they were defective in character, as they were, but notwithstanding their defects. He would give them an opportunity to learn in his school, meekness and lowliness of heart, that they, they might become co-laborers with him. Gospel workers. So, if you say you have a defect, yes. The Lord still wants you. Not because of your defects, but because if you respond to the Lord, He will help you with opportunities to learn and overcome your defects. And then you become useful for the Lord. Thus, the Lord Jesus is still dealing with men. Some who are imperfect in character are connected with solemn, sacred interests. And when chosen for a special work, they should not feel that their own wisdom is sufficient, that they need not be counseled, reproved, and instructed. Brethren, if you feel thus, you will separate from the source of your strength and will be in peril. You may be left to your own supposed sufficiency to do as Judas did. So, God has called each one of us to be connected with Him, even with our defects, so that He can perfect us. Only we must respond with meekness, humility, and accept the teaching of our Lord. Uh, natural character faults do not seem to be uh, factors to disqualify the candidate for God's work. If you look at Peter, he was headstrong. Always, uh, he, he acted as if he had two mouths and one ear. Whereas uh, most people have two ears and one mouth. But Peter was that kind of person, you know spoke too quickly. So that was a big defect. Uh, and then overconfident, Peter, yes, I will go and die for you, Lord, and then ran away. The night the Lord was uh, uh, taken prisoner. In fact, just before he ran away, he, he did something he thought was brave, he cut off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. But even with that show of uh, strength, he still was a coward. Uh, James, uh, he, he was very quiet, you know, until after 
Jesus' uh, resurrection. Then he, he became, uh, oh, I should say that the brother of Jesus. Uh, John and James, <clears throat> the sons of uh, uh, thunder, they had hot tempers, very hot tempers. They would call fire down from heaven to burn up people who didn't believe in Jesus. But Jesus said, not so quickly, please. Uh, they also need to learn the truth. Philip was actually a bigger doubter than Thomas. Uh, and Thomas, of course, we know as a doubting Thomas. Uh, Paul also had a hot temper and uh, not so patient with John Mark. After one missionary journey where John Mark cut short his uh, work with uh, Paul because it was too hard, Paul said, get out of here. <laughs> I don't want you. But Paul, Paul had a big argument with, uh, what's his name that starts with S? Bar uh, start Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. Yeah, big argument over John Mark. Uh, and John Mark, the coward that he was couldn't stand hardship. Later on, came back and was a good worker. So you can see that natural character faults do not seem to disqualify people. Do you have a character fault? I do. But if you're willing for God to work with it, He can make use of you. Uh, education doesn't seem to be an important factor either. Uh, I've heard people tell me, oh, you are so well educated. You know, of course you can be a Sabbath school teacher. Uh, you had the opportunity to take music uh, in college. That's why you're so good in music. Um, and so on and so on. You know, that I have had so many advantages. And I thank the Lord for the advantages. And I hope I continue to use these advantages that God has given me. But if you look at Peter, James, and John, they were fishermen. How much education did they have? Very little formal education. But they were educated by the master teacher, Jesus Christ, for about three and a half years. I don't know if they took notes, <laughs> but they learned by watching. There was a Luke, well, he was a doctor. Matthew, probably educated, he was a tax collector. Paul the Apostle was very highly educated. So was Martin Luther. Yeah. And so were many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. But out of all those, only Paul responded initially. Later on after Jesus' death, many of them responded. But you can see education is very varied among the people that Jesus chose to work for him. So your lack of education or too much education is not a detriment. Uh, there was one time when someone said, too much education is a detriment in God's work. You look at all those people who have left the church. It's because they went to the university and they learned this higher criticism of the Bible. Now they believe in uh, uh, evolution, uh, the age of the earth being millions and millions of years old. Now they doubt the Bible. See, education is a problem. Uh, and it's true. Many people who go to uh, the universities uh, are exposed to secular interpretation of natural phenomena and they begin to doubt the Word of God. It's true. But the other way around is people like uh, Martin Luther, a doctor of uh, theology, who found the Lord in his studies instead of leaving the Lord. And there are many others that have wrote good commentaries. Uh, Dr. Veith, V-E-I-T-H, uh, has made many, many DVDs on science as well as the Bible. He's very well educated. He used to teach evolution. Now he teaches creationism. So education, too much education, is not necessarily a problem. Neither is lack of education. God can use all people. Uh, characteristics that qualify a candidate to be a worker for God is 
humility, teachability, love for God, and love for man. You, if you have these characteristics, you can be a worker for God. Now, I think of Dr. Pun Chek Yat. He was a son of thunder. I think uh, Hong Kong Hin will know. Very hot temper. I remember one time playing games at the hospital grounds uh, before it got all covered up with black top now. <laughs> he got so angry with Chiao Bun, I believe. He, he slapped him and was very angry. And uh, Chiao Tech, the big brother, almost had a big fight with uh, Pun Chek Yet. Also, Pun Chek Yet was a something from downtown Si Tiao Law. 4th Street, Taisin Street. Uh, and, and so he was uh, not an easy guy to get along with. But now he is the ministerial director, I believe, of the Northern Pacific uh, Division. He's become very humble. And when you talk to him, he really listens. He's not as hot-tempered as he used to be. Uh, and, and so God made use of Poon Chek Yat. Yeah. How about Dr. Eric Louis sitting here? You know, I was gone to the U.S. many years. He came back before I did. And when I came back after many years, I saw Dr. Eric Louis preaching. I said, wow, never heard Eric Louis preach before. And it was a good sermon. I said, wow, that guy has really grown. Uh, and he continues to do so. How about Sarah Jane Chan and Shanice Lim? You know, they, they led out in song service here. And they even gave us a vocal duet. Yeah. They're young, they're scared, but they're making use of the rod in their hand. How about Tiffany Tian? I think she's the smallest, the youngest vocalist in our church. Uh, how many of you say, well, you know, I'm not educated. I didn't take lessons like you, Dr. Oh, I cannot sing. And Tiffany didn't say that. She just said, Mom, I'm scared, but I'll do it. <laughs> and she does it. I remember when she first did it, she almost ran off the stage before she started the song. But as she did more and more, she's getting better. Uh, how about Mary Muru and Dorothy Lee, you know? Uh, Dorothy is not with us today. Uh, you don't see them doing too much in church, but you know, they are doing a visitation ministry that most of us don't do, too lazy to do, afraid to do, cannot do, no time. Huh? They're visiting the sick, they're visiting shut-ins, they're bringing cheer, they're bringing, they are being a blessings uh, to people. And they don't go around telling people what they're doing. Only God knows all the good that they have done. So let us all be heroes by overturning our handicaps, like Tingson, into privileges through God's power. Let us by faith do things that seem impossible to us. But God can make the rods in our hands to be powerful instruments for him. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And if you really believe in this uh, statement of Paul as a promise, then you will be able to be part of this vibrant church, bringing the gospel to many people yet to know about him.